got Mervin on the line. Uh, present. <laughs> Alison. Yes, I'm here. And Claire. Yes, I'm here. Brilliant. So the first question, uh, I think, uh, which is quite a, an interesting one, sort of uh, going along with uh, all of the presentations, uh, is one about anticoagulation and its effect uh, on uh, hypoxemia. Uh, so, Mervyn, do you want to comment on that at all? Do you think anticoagulation yeah. helps improve hypoxemia? Yeah, that's a great question because clearly uh, we know this disease carries a, a very high risk of thromboses, um, both venous, arterial and pulmonary emboli. And we certainly had some of our patients presenting to the emergency department with the stonking big pulmonary emboli. So clearly in those patients, we've actually been thrombolizing. Um, I think it's a moot point as to how effective heparin is. Um, interestingly, we looked at it here and uh, many of the coagulation factors are normal, antithrombin is normal, protein S, protein C is normal, so we've only found a high von Willebrand, big von Willebrand factor. So how effective uh, heparin is, don't know, other places around the world are trying um, various thrombolytics um, and so forth, thrombin inhibitors, um, and frankly, uh, we don't know the answer, so what we're tending to do is give high dose prophylactic in to everybody and for those with proven DVTs or PEs, we're going uh, full anticoagulation with an oxyparin. Grant, does anybody else want to comment on that? No, I just want, want to add that, that um, this is obviously a, a real concern and, and in some situations by the time the patients actually end up in critical care, um, the, the the micro thrombi are already there, so it's, it's almost a case of anticoagulating them beforehand if that's what, what's going to happen. Um, but NHS England are about to produce some, uh, probably some guidance on, on this, so keep an eye out on their website. Okay, and then just to sort of relate to that, and then we'll move on to, uh, to the slightly different topic is the, the role of D dimers in these patients. Does anybody think they have a role? Well, we, we've been using it. If they shoot up, especially if they shoot up without the other uh, inflammatory markers shooting up as a sign to look for uh, pulmonary emboli, also you can use air code to look at um, right heart strain, etc. So uh, I think that there is a role. It's non-specific, but certainly a very big jump is suggested. Grand. So if we go back to sort of uh, CPAP, Mervyn, uh, I had a question uh, about uh, what the average duration of CPAP was. Could you just remind us about that? Yeah. So in, in our hands, um, basically, they've been lasting three to four days. And so these are patients who either do well and, and uh, can go back to oxygen, go back to the ward, or um, progress to ventilation. So clearly, some people are mask intolerant or they're just not coping and need early intubation. We had one guy of 190 kilos who managed about, I think it was nine or 10 days on CPAP, and thankfully we didn't need to intubate him because I think that would have been uh, our worst nightmare and his. And thankfully he did well and uh, has gone home. Uh, and, and sort of a, a related question to that, uh, we're talking about compliance with CPAP. Uh, any little tricks that you found that made, made things easier for people? Um, and well, again, with the shortages, but um, just long-standing experience with CPAP. Some people like um, a partial face mask covering nose and mouth. Some like a full face mask. Some like the helmet. Um, unfortunately, uh, because of shortages, we often just had to rely on partial face masks, which some people cope with very well. Others don't like. And we often tried small amounts of uh, an opiate or midazolam just to try and chill them out. And again, it worked in some, but often when we had CPAP failures, it was uh, that claustrophobic failure to tolerate the mask rather than the CPAP itself. Grand. So going back to uh, proning, uh, interesting question here. Uh, I'm not sure how many pregnant patients we've actually had to intubate in this uh, current wave. I uh, don't know if either anybody on the on the line has had experience of that. Uh, and if not, 
how would we prone pregnant patients? Do we think it's not possible? I think it, the, the, the issue is obviously the, um, how, how pregnant the, the, the patient is. Um, I think in the early stage of pregnancy, it's not a problem. Um, as you get further on in, into the, the pregnancy, the, the, the actual physical problems of, of the patient being prone, but they can be semi-recumbent. Um, and so you have to prop up one side of the body uh, with, with pillows. Um, but also, if, if they are heavily pregnant, then the, the actual um, benefit of turning patients prone would be less effective because of the, the fetus actually limiting the improvement in diaphragmatic excursion. So it can be done, but it's very patient dependent. And so, sort of, the patients that hopefully don't get to us or whether it might help us if, if somebody's got some mild COVID symptoms should we be getting the GPs to tell them to sleep prone? Um, yeah that, I've been asked that question before and, and uh, I think JK Rowling was singing the praises of, of proning when, when she had COVID. I don't think there's any harm in um, suggesting that patients at home do turn themselves prone if it helps and makes their work of breathing easier. But my concern would be that that lulls the patient into a false sense of security and that they then perhaps present to hospital late. Because we know a lot of patients can be quite hypoxemic but not have many symptoms. So I think it's a fine balance there to be taken. Okay, uh, and one sort of last question on proning for the moment. Uh, have you seen any pressure sores uh, on sort of the uh, on the on the front of the body in people that are sort of not used to proning? Well, I think if if we're talking about conscious patients, one of the one of the benefits of that is, as I said in in my talk, patient comfort is is a priority. Um, and so a patient will tend to move themselves if they get uncomfortable before the pressure sores actually appear. And um, when we're proning in um, unconscious patients in intensive care, then we're very careful about pressure areas. But where you can see pressure sores is not all over the abdomen, or sort of all over the anterior um, body, but it's things like if we turn the patient's head to the side, either if they're in the fully prone position, so you can get pressure sores on the ears, um, on the knees, and sometimes on the on the toes and things. So it's it's in in sort of you know strange areas. It's not just over the whole body, but in the conscious patient, I think it'd be more protected. Gosh. Okay. So Claire, let's get you to do some work here. So uh, I had a question about uh, how long it takes for AKI to recover. Um, and what, what I think you, you sort of you, you've given us lots of uh, evidence about the mortality, but uh, sort of longer term, what do you think about recovery, and what's the sort of the likelihood of long term damage? So that, that's a good question, and I think we haven't quite got to the end of this um, to know the answer that in full. Certainly, some patients are recovering, um, and. Quite a few of our patients on PD have recovered, and I think that in part was due, certainly in the early days, that when you put the PD fluid in, if they're really dehydrated, they'll actually absorb it, and so they got some rehydration from it, and that helped. And some of those patients recovered quite quickly. Other patients who probably have different etiologies are taking much longer to recover. At King's, we've had 11 step downs, um, and I think most of them are on the path to recovery. A number of them have gone back the normal renal function, but certainly not all of them. In the long run, I'm sure there will be a knock-on effect of AKI. We know AKI for all causes before the COVID pandemic is a big risk factor of developing chronic kidney disease. Um, it triggers a fibrotic response in the kidney, so I'm sure there will be swelling from it. Um, but I'm not, it's too early to say how many of those patients that survive um, their intensive care admission who had acute kidney injury will recover their renal function or whether some of them will be less effectively with end stage kidney. Certainly those patients that had chronic kidney disease beforehand are much more likely to be left with long term kidney uh, problems. Okay, so so a question that sort of goes alongside that. 
how often are people sort of doing renal biopsies and, and, and which patients should we think, be thinking about doing that in, if at all? So we're not doing them in the intensive care setting because it wouldn't change management. Um, if we were to get uh, a treatment that would change management, it would be something we'd consider in the future. One of the interesting papers, one of the interesting things coming out of the papers from China was that they showed quite a lot of um, proteinuria in patients being admitted to hospital, even if they didn't have marked AKI, which tends to imply that it is direct viral damage um, to, the, to the kidney causing that. And I know a couple of people who have been biopsied, they've come off of ICU and continue to have heavy proteinuria. And there have been some cases published of showing that those patients have what's called a collapsing um, FSGS lesion, which is a lesion that we recognize viruses cause. So that's the lesion you get with HIV and parvovirus. Having said that, it's not, there is no further treatment, so there's no real benefit gained from doing that biopsy. Okay, um, and a question here about uh, IV fluids. Uh, do we need to give IV fluids until fully recovered, or once they're, so by that I presume the, the question's about sort of you know, using these are getting back towards normal, or when they're able to eat and drink? Uh, any ideas? I think if you're managing someone outside of ICU, then uh, a good fluid balance chart monitoring intake and outtake and you can't actually beat examining these patients on a daily basis to assess their fluid status um, and making a judgment based on that. Some of these patients remain maintained quite good urine output so it really varies on a patient patient to patient basis and just doing a good fluid assessment. Okay so uh, a question for all of you I think but I'll start with Claire. Um, so some people have found that Sodium levels of these patients can be quite high. 180. Oh, gosh, I've not heard of that. That's, that's quite impressive. Uh, any thoughts of pathophysiology beyond dehydration? I think most. It's certainly true that lots of them got very high sodium levels, and I think that was largely driven by dehydration. The proximal tubular cells does express the ACE2 receptor, which is the receptor that the virus binds to. So there has been some debate about whether that could affect sodium handling in the kidney. But certainly, once we stop dehydrating these patients, fewer of them had the hyponatremia. Okay, so let's go back to the, the lungs a bit. Uh, question about BiPAP. So, Mervyn, do you just want to explain the difference between BiPAP and CPAP and then what you think the role for BiPAP is or isn't? Yeah. So, so BiPAP gives um, support both in the inspiratory phase and the expiratory phase. So when the patient takes a breath in, there's the, the BiPAP machine just pushes um, a bit of additional air to improve the tidal volume. And, and so essentially that's not been a major issue in COVID patients. They usually have very, very high tidal volumes. They're hyperventilating. And so they don't need a machine to give them added inspiratory support. So we have used this occasionally in some patients who are tiring, the COPD patients who often need a little bit of support, but by and large, it's the proning as Alison described and CPAP or high flow nasal oxygen. And uh, so uh, the next question on CPAP then is clearly, you know, the, a lot of experience on, a, uh, on the ICU settings, a lot of respiratory wards have been running CPAP, uh, which do you think is the preferred place? Um, and is having respiratory on call 24-7 an essential part if you're going to have it off ICU? Um, I think the answer is yes. Uh, we, we had a brilliant relationship and have a brilliant relationship with our respiratory physicians, and so we work very closely. And again, the patients who they were identifying as needing to come our way, um, we were obviously being told about them early on, and we could shift them to an intensive care bed. So. I think having that level of expertise, as I mentioned in my talk, they want, went on a crash program of trying to enhance the knowledge base of how to use CPAP across many more nurses and doctors than would be usually using it. So, and these were actually extremely well attended talks uh, that they gave. Um, so lots of nurses, docs uh, came along and listened. And actually, to their credit, uh, you know, the teaching has been extremely good and. Uh, the response, their outcomes have been very good too. 
but it does need expertise. A question. Um, so a question about proning patients uh, on peritoneal dialysis. Uh, sounds like that's not too much of an issue, uh, Alison and Claire. Well, yeah, well, it's from the, from the actual positioning point of view, it's a difficult one because obviously we, we only normally prone in, in intensive care in the unconscious patient and we don't tend to use peritoneal dialysis on, on intensive care. So it's not something that we have a, a, a lot of experience with, but the same, the same would go for anybody that, that has increased intra-abdominal content for whatever reason. Um, and and, and if, if the, there's, there's no harm in putting the patient prone if they're on PD, so long as it doesn't interact with the, um, the effectiveness of the dialysis. Um, and it, it may just well um, reduce the um, the positive impact that proning has. So it, it's very much on a patient-to-patient, -patient, you know, individual basis, but it's not a contraindication. And Claire? Yes, we, we talked about this um, a lot. In fact, in our placement of catheters, we put the exit site more laterally than we would normally so that we could still access it if we were going to prone the patient. Uh, the South is a team of intensivists in South Africa that use PD uh, a lot of um, as a low-cost form of renal placement therapy, and they have quite a lot of experience with proning patients. And they suggested that if we did do it, and we haven't had to be, thanks, uh, that we would transduce the intra-abdominal pressure through a bladder catheter so that we could make sure it didn't go above 18 to 20 centimetres of water. So we were prepared to do it, but we haven't had to do it yet. Uh, and a question sort of along the lines of doing PD outside of the ICU setting. How is there much experience with that? So we, most PD is done by patients themselves in their own home with their machine next to their bed. So uh, there's a lot of um, experience doing PD in the community and on the wards. Uh, it was just new to take it into the ICU setting, at least in the UK. So, so we have experience of people who've not been on PD before who needed renal replacement therapy, but also not needed ITU escalation for their chest. Yes, yes. So we, we've yeah. been putting in PD catheters for AKI in patients outside of the ITU for a little while. Brilliant. Okay, I think given the time, I'm afraid I'm going to have to draw things to a close there. Uh, the, 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 the volume of questions we've had, I think, has shown how much interest this has sparked.